everybody and welcome back to the Moshix Mainframe channel. This is Moshix. And today we're going to be having some fun looking at the binaries uh, in ZOS, which we call load modules in the in the ZOS uh, parlance. And, and we're going to be disassembling those. Disassembling is an age-old term, which means from something that was either compiled and then assembled or directly assembled into a binary module, which this is what we call it in the in the x86 world, um, which means a, a module that can be loaded into memory and then executed, uh, turning it back into an assembler program. There's also a, a slightly different animal called a decompiler, which turns a load module or a binary back into the original programming language. That's, of course, much more difficult to accomplish because um, from a compiled language, we we have, first of all, the principle that uh, not every uh, high-level language statement uh, equates to one assembly statement or machine language statement, um, whereas in the assembler world, it does. Um, and that's, of course, one of the main differences that in assembler program, every assembly statement equates into a machine statement. And when you go from, from a, a low module or from a binary back into programming, high-level programming language, source code, uh, that is much, much more tricky. Uh, the second reason is um, that in the high-level programming language world, we use something called optimization, which we have looked at extensively in this channel. For instance, if you look at the video about Fortran, or at the one about uh, comparing the PL1 compiler from 50 years ago to the PL1 compiler on modern ZOS systems, you'll realize that quite a bit of optimization is done. Um, and so not always you'll be able to go from a binary back to the original or very rarely I should say back into the original high level programming language but for assembler it works that's the good news so from a binary you can go and translate it one to one from machine language back into assembly human readable assembly statement which makes it much more easy to understand and follow so on ZOS there is an assembly um, a disassembly program called uh, it's it's from a tool chain called the IBM Toolkit feature uh, it is assembler many disassemblers exist especially if you go to the CBT tape CBT tape uh, everybody doing serious mainframe work should know the CBT tape if you go here this is run by my friend Sam Golub uh, if you go there you'll search for disassembler there must be at least 20 disassembler disassemblers on uh, this tape uh, we've discussed the CBT tape extensively in other places and um, and uh, there is many disassemblers there and they work generally some are for MVS some are for uh, for later versions of MVS or ZOS the good news about the IBM official disassembler is that uh, in theory you should know about all the newest instructions present on your machines whereas uh, with the CBT disassemblers you're you don't really know if those uh, newer uh, machine codes, if they exist in those disassemblers. Probably not all of them. Anyway, I have a very good friend um, who is uh, a wizard at the University of Leipzig in Germany. He's a mainframe wizard. In fact, he owns his own private uh, mainframe at home, a Z9. And, um, and he was very gracious to grant me an account at the University of, of Leipzig uh, data center. They have a Z14 there, and I have an account there. And uh, and on that machine, they have the IBM toolkit disassembler. And we're going to be ex exercising that a little bit today. Uh, before we go there, um, here is the manual for it. It's called uh, High Level Assembler we want our six toolkit feature users guide and um, and that's what we're going to be using so let's read first before we start running programs always read uh, the f manual first uh, this is a reproduces assembly language store stores source statements and a pseudo listing uh, using object code as input uh, it runs on both Z on zos on vm and on zvs e uh, it has its own notation. Access registers are called AR, obviously. Control registers CR0, floating point FR. General purpose are going to be R0, which we are very familiar with from this channel. And the vector registers are VR0. 
I've never personally used vector register, so this is the one part I really don't know much about. Um, now, uh, this part I really want to I want to um, highlight, and that's uh, when you disassemble low modules, you may actually not always, but sometimes may be infringing on copyright uh, notices, and that means that when when people write source code and then compile it into a load module uh, into binary and then you go and disassemble it you're basically looking at the source code especially if the binary if the load module came from an assembly program and so um, IBM tries to protect the intellectual property of programmers as I think they should um, and uh, and you'll see that IBM has several ways for you to protect your binary. Uh, if you have anywhere the copyright sign, or if you put the copyright sign at XB4, at hex B4 location, or if you write copyright uh, anywhere in your source code, then uh, the disassembler will refuse to disassemble the program with message ASM D0. Now you can over come that by putting it up as an invocation parameter as you can see here copyright okay <laughs> so I think it's just a way for IBM to um, make people sensitive to the copyright issues and you need to of course be aware of the license of the software you're gonna do, go and disassemble and um, I think the easiest thing is to write your own assembly program assemble it and then disassemble it um, and then you should be good but be aware of this restrictions so here's the manual um, it just tells us how to invoke the disassembler we can put this uh, away for now and just look at this um, just uh, let's select this so you're not going to be distract distracted so here is the is my JCL uh, we invoke it with uh, this the program is called ASN DSM. It resides in the step library here. Sys one dot SASM mode two. And now sysprint is obvious. You just print to a file. Now if you want to print to a uh, to a file so you can look at it and it and by the way, the good thing is if you disassemble a low module and then syspunch it to a file, then it's basically assembly. And then you could assemble it again into a load module, which maybe we should uh, do just for fun here. So um, why don't we allocate a file, a sequential file, and we punch a, a disassemble load module into that file. So let's go, let's allocate a little file here. Um, this one, and we make this Uh, FB AD Oops, what where did we go wrong here? Okay. So now we have Moshix JCL this one. Let's go back. One, and we put it in here. Moshix JCL this one disposition share and um, this is the linkage editor the IBM linkage editor which I don't really think we should disassemble let's take a very simple program the age old uh, IBM program that does nothing it just branches back to whence it came uh, and uh, there is a video that I have on um, YouTube FBR14, where I actually create my own FBR14 utility, and uh, this is M52. And if you if you go look here at this video, you see I program my own IFBR14. And again, IFBR14 is a, is a program that does nothing. It jump it jumps back from whence it came, but it's useful when you want to use JCL just to allocate or delete data sets or do stuff at the at the um, at the data set level without actually running a real program. So uh, since this program is uh, fairly documented out in the internet, even by IBM themselves, I think we're fine with disassembling this program. 
uh, I just want to make sure that it's actually in sys1.link lib. So let's go sys1.link lib. And let's browse here, load date, ifbr. Yes, so it's here. Uh, if you look at it now, it, this is a load module ready to be executed. This is what we're going to be disassembly, uh, disassembling today for fun. Uh, swap one. Here's our little program. And so let's run it and see what comes out. Uh, this is job 8390. Oh, JCL error. I wonder what happened. Oh, yeah, I know what happened. <laughs> DSN. Okay, that should work. 8391. Return code zero. We always like that. And then uh, SD. And by the way, folks, this is um, ZOS 2.1, which is not the latest version of ZOS. 2.3 is out already, but it's good enough for what we want to do. And this is a real machine, so it, it's lightning fast and a lot of fun to work with. Um, so let's, this is just a cancel job. Let's take this one. Oh, 83, what was it? Oh, here it is. Okay, so we have now this output from this job, this ran, oh, what just happened? Uh, I messed up the terminal. Okay. Okay, sorry. Um, so this ran fine. As you can see, um, of course, it was extremely fast. This is a real fast machine. Uh, start, I mean, not even a tenth, hundred thousandths, ten thousand, not even a ten thousandth of a second. It must have been less. We just don't know exactly. I mean, look at the fa how fast this thing is. It only uses 268, uh, or 356 kilobytes of virtual memory, so it's a very small program. Um, so we use copyright OK, since uh, IBM has, has extensively documented this load module everywhere on the internet. And so it tells us that this is the module we use, IFBR14. And concatenation, nothing, tells a little bit about. Now, one thing we need to understand is that a load module is not just the machine code of the program and that's it. There is always a little bit of information uh, ahead of the program. There's a header and there's a format to uh, binary modules. The same, by the way, on x86. Windows has its format for binary modules. Linux has its own. And uh, there's a format which tells a little bit about the program, what kind of program it is, where it needs to be loaded. There's some information. So it's not just a dump of the binary and that's it. Uh, very important to understand. Then we have a external symbol table. Of course, the CSECT. Uh, the code section name uh, we all know is IFBR14 and that's all we can see from the outside and now here is the world famous IBM program IFBR14 in all its glory it resets here the uh, return code to zero because R15 register 15 um, contains the return code of a program this is what we see when we when we run a program and we see return code zero that's where it came from the ultimate pro invoker program if it receives a zero well, and it finds no errors on its own will report a zero return code back to the caller and how do you reset the return code well you could do an la load address zero into r15 to load the zero value into r15 but actually this um, subtraction of R15 from R15. So what this means is whatever value is in R15 is subtracted from its own and stored it back into R15. And it turns out that this is slightly faster, just a tiny little bit faster than other methods of storing zero into register 15. And that's why they um, used this way. And then we branch to R14. R14 is the address by convention in the 
uh, MVS and ZOS world, it's by convention, that's the address of where the caller wants to be returned to. So the, uh, somebody called this program and and so the caller wants to be returned after this program finishes to this address here, the return address. And so, um, and so by branching 14, we we'll return back to whence we came. And that's why uh, this program is called IFBR 14. Okay, IF means in, uh, these are the core modules of the MVS or ZOS um, operating system, branch 14, as you can see here. And of course, every person on earth will know the sequence here 1BFF. Um, uh, F, of course, it stands for the first register, F, the second F stands for this register, 1B subtract register. So 1B subtract register 15 from 15, which effectively sets it to zero, and then branch to register E, which is 14. Uh, so very simple program, and um, and uh, and now um, we can go and check what happened with the uh, with the output. This is of course sys out sys print. Let's see what happened with uh, swip two start to start four more shakes. Uh, and here is the output. <laughs> Here's our little program. Now we can we can run this through the assembler, and it will assemble it again into the exact same. I mean, byte by byte, exact same load module in the end as we have as we have here. Okay, um, which is basically this sequence here. So um, now we can try something else. Let's see what happens. see what happens if um, we remove the copyright okay so is this copyrighted I don't think it is because we only have about eight bytes in this program I want to. I like always to have the latest program I compiled or assembled on the top, not at the bottom. So, I, how do I fix this? Sort drop ID descending, and then uh, oops. Well, I don't have the rights to cancel anything, but it uh, doesn't matter. So, uh, we don't have the copyright notice, but since there is no copyright enforcement here by IBM in this in this um, module, it still disassembles it. Now let's see what happens. Let's see what happens if we put in here the linkage error. I'm pretty sure IBM has copyright notices in its linkage error because that's a major program. Uh, 8393 and it's fine let's go see 8393 of course as you can see here this is 87 lines and this is 643 lines uh, but it looks like it disassembled that as well yes and here already several interesting things um, as you can see here there's an Elias um, from high level linkage editor to the old linkage editor program and as well as to loader because another way to invoke the 
to a loader program so called the loader which is really the loader nowadays and the linkage editor are one and the same thing and so we can see it here um, all this external symbols very familiar to us this is the text of the program text means the the code the machine the machine code for this program of course quite a bit bigger and since there is no copyright IBM allows us to disassemble this program so um, this is very interesting so the C has several entries for the same code section interesting um, let's see what happens here some definitions so that they show up in the in the in the in the text okay then sets up um, addressability saves the registers looks at the yeah here it looks at the input parameters okay I mean here's an extensive uh, program you can see that this is not quite um, what human how humans would write code um, of course this assembly doesn't know how humans wrote it so it just disassembles from machine code and humans wouldn't write, really write it like this um, but you can see also one more thing which is it uses very basic uh, assembly uh, machine codes there's no advanced machine codes here all this were as, I, as far as I can see were present already in the 370 um, architecture oh except for this one so these are these are different ones these are uh, these are uh, um, newer instructions yeah so um, this is the IBM loader let's go and uh, see what else we can do let's see the world famous IEB copy what happens if we disassemble that? Okay, that went through fine. And that is a, that is a bigger program, as you can see here. of the program and here is the assembly code right yeah this is definitely a bigger program it's well organized so you can still see how humans organize the program by just looking at the binary um, of course all that this assembler does is follows byte by byte and the and decodes that instruction back into assembly but still, you can still see how the humans organize this. And um, I've seen examples where from the uh, disassembled output, I could see if it was written in originally in assembly or if it was written in a higher lang level language. You can see that clearly um, from the way the program is written. So this is obviously a much bigger program. Um, now, one thing we should do for fun's sake is this assembler the disassembler <laughs> so um, uh, m mod 2 uh, and we disassemble it will disassemble itself to this is to the disassembler it doesn't really uh, matter what um, what it disassembles and so if it's disassembling itself it will really do not care at all so let's run this and see what comes out a395 and that went through as well so no copyright issues I guess um, yes and that is even bigger 
and I'm sure there's somewhere a table in this program with the machine codes that's how I would write a disassembler and by the way I wrote once a disassembler for the 6502 CPU which is the one that's present on the Apple II uh, many 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 moons ago I was just a teenager so I have an idea how to write I don't know if, if my way to write a disassembler is the most um, I shall say most efficient most effective way to do it but I did this assembly correctly okay uh, this to me already looks like it wasn't written in assembly I can tell you that right off the bat maybe somebody from IBM is watching and they will uh, and they will correct me but this looks to me like it was written in something higher level, maybe PLX, which is the IBM internal programming language for their systems programming. It's very similar to PL1, but it's closer to the to the to the iron. Uh, IBM very briefly sold the PLX compiler. You could get it, uh, but then they stopped again. But you find plenty of PLX source code examples out there on the internet if you really look for it. Yeah, I mean, to me, this looks like clearly this came from a high level programming language because this refers to there's clearly a table here at work okay um, yeah this is the loop where it compares actually the machine code yeah 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 this came this came from a high level programming language I don't know which one, could be C, could be PL, uh, PLX, maybe somebody from IBM wants to chime in in the comments below this video and let us know if they can, if they want, if they care where this came from. But this doesn't look human written assembler, not because of course, because of the, uh, of the text itself, because of the way, but because of the way it's structured structure looks coming from something higher yeah here are the tables yep yeah so um, so far oh yeah mm -hmm. so here are the tables so far this is exactly how we'll write a high level uh, a disassembler but it does look to me it came from a high level language which is all fine and good no problem whatsoever uh, it does, of course, invoke uh, some system services. That's where you have the find the SVC. Yeah, SVC, of course, is the assembler equivalent of of um, of a signal in Unix or Linux when, when you request a system, an operating system service. Um, you can go and look here what SVC 19 is. Um, SVC 19 is open. So here it opens a file. Okay. Oh. Yes. And then the parameters for we could look up now. The bits it moves in. This looks like it's being open for reading. Okay, so um, yeah, so uh, this is a lot of fun. I'm having a blast with this assembler. Um, now, one thing we could do is uh, look for CBT disassembler. Oh, and by the way, folks, I want to thank Sam Golub because Sam Golub did an amazing thing. He put the video, the, the list of all Moshik's videos on this channel, which you're watching right now, in file 977 of the CBT tape. Now, being in the CBT tape gives you kind of 
uh, status within the name framework community. I'm quite amazed that uh, I ended up being there. Uh, I know this fellow here in Florida, Seymour. Um, I know some, this person, you know, unfortunately has passed away. Um, these are giants. Uh, Greg Price, whom we know from the Hercules community, is the person who wrote Review, um, the MBS uh, editor that which, which we use in TK4. Uh, Howard Dean, uh, Rob Scott, I mean, these are all giants, um, ladies and gentlemen. And then there's the humble me here somewhere. <laughs> all I did here is just write, make a couple of videos. Well, this is M75, I think, but still, I mean, uh, all my, my contribution is just using the stuff that giants wrote and that the great developers at IBM wrote. Uh, one of the pleasurable things about working the mainframe is that the quality of the software and hardware is just its just at least an order of magnitude above and beyond what you have in the x86 world. This stuff is stable, it runs, it's extremely well documented, uh, there's a very good quality control. Of course, we all screw up and IBM has screwed up in the past with certain things and people I get angry sometimes, but um, that stuff that doesn't work as documented. But uh, by and large, this is just a much better and much more fun environment because you can understand it all. In the x86 world, even just within Linux, which is an area I know well, I really just know parts of the kernel. And the kernel is so big because it needs to do many, many platforms and it support thousands of different hardware um, cards that it's just impossible to understand even a tiny percentage of it and it's changes too it's changing too quickly and bugs are everywhere and things are not stable whereas here in the mainframe world that's what i like about it it's just it's just uh, everything is much more understandable it's all within the one same common base and uh, it's just uh, it's just an amazing environment so these are all giants and for me it's an honor here uh, for Moshiks to be listed in the same page with this giant so thank you Sam Golub and uh, thank you community for making this channel so amazing so anyway so here um, we wanted to look for a disassembler and um, I can log in to a um, well I could log in now to the uh, um, to my MBS in the cloud and by the way if you want an account all you need to do is go to this page here Moshix, you go here there's a form you fill it out your real name your email and you need to put your real email because otherwise I won't be able to send you your account details why you want to have an account TSO account on the MVS in the cloud the desired login ID desired desired password agree to the service which is do not screw things up the, the terms of the service are here and then submit and then I'll get an email with, with, with this request I'll grab an engine account within a few days I travel quite a bit so but if I am near a terminal somewhere I'll create your account and send you your account so but you could go there the CBT tape is mounted there and uh, why don't I just quickly show you how Oops. Um. Here's a CBT tape. Um, that's what we're looking at here. And uh, Sam Golub's maintained CBT tape. And of course, um, mine is 97, file 977, which is not here yet because this is, uh, hasn't been updated in, qu in about two years. But it will be there when um, when Jurgen, the maintainer of TQ4, updates uh, to update nine. Pretty sure he will update the CPT tapes as well. Um, and there is a table. We could download it as a zip file, which which becomes an XMI file. We could upload it, and then it's just a table of all my videos in the Moshix mainframe channel. Uh, but in there somewhere there's a. So let's see again. This assembler. This is file 217. So let's look for file 217. It's on problem one. Okay, here's file 17. Mm, this is not it. Uh, 217, maybe it's in two. Uh, 
217. Yes. So you can see here, this is a disassembler. Let's see what platform it's written for. Uh, for that, I want to get... Uh, this is a program to create an assembler source program from a load module in a PDS. DD cards require include sysprint for message diagnostic on the blocks as a multiple of 121. Syslib. Alright, I can tell you this looks like an older disassembler. Syspunch is for the output file. Yeah, this is uh, from 1977, author of Thornton, I've heard his name before, and Stima as well, 1989. Um, there is several disassemblers. Uh, disassemblers, but this should work on MVS. So maybe what I'll do is I'll port this MVS, this program to our cloud MVS, and make it accessible for you in the next, let's say, four or five days. I have about 100 users on the MVS um, instance in the cloud, the one that you've seen here. And uh, and then you can have fun disassembling stuff. Why don't I do that? Um, so let me just copy this over for now. And what is this? Oh, it's a several. So actually we need to, yeah, here's the, here is the JCL to assemble it. So, this one, this two, Matlib. Let's call it. Yeah, I mean, I have to work on this. We don't have enough time in this video to do this. But um, I will assemble this. And then uh, what is this? Yeah, this is there's several steps here. Yeah. Okay, so I will assemble this and put this on the um, on the Moshix uh, cloud MVS system. If you have a TSO logon, you can just go and use it. I'll put in a notice when once it's up and running. Uh, well, once you log in, you will see a notice that it's available. Uh, and you, you can do pretty much the same games that I've been playing here today with this ZOS, this assembler by IBM. And um, if you don't have a Moshix uh, Cloud MVS TSO login account, please uh, get to this website, moshix.dainu.net. Uh, fill out the form and get your account today. It's free. It's great. Um, we have about 100 people there today. And... Uh, and I had fun playing with the disassembler. I may be doing one more video once I do more interesting stuff with it. Maybe disassemble and then assemble it back and compare. And uh, thank you for watching. I had uh, a lot of fun with this. Uh, if you haven't subscribed to the Motion X Mainframe channel, please do consider subscribing today. If you like this particular video, do press on the thumbs up button. Always uh, glad to see those. Thank you very much and goodbye.